Welcome to Inclusion 101, our crash course in disability awareness and best practices for inclusion. The Nora Project believes that everyone should learn about disability as a natural and expected part of human diversity. When people are informed about disability, they are better able to adopt what we call an ability-inclusive mindset. The Nora Project staff wants all of our participants to feel confident and comfortable when thinking and speaking about disability. The content laid out in this presentation aims to prepare you to speak about disability using progressive language and in line with the vision of the Nora Project, be an ally and encourage others to adjust their speech when necessary, and to act as an ambassador of the Nora Project by living out the ability-inclusive mindset. We'll start by examining language. Language can be frustrating. We all want to say the right things, and what is acceptable or appropriate can change quickly. But what we say and the way we say it matters to individuals and makes an impact on the way society perpetuates negative ideas about disability. By modeling appropriate and progressive language, we can begin to shift the way that people think and speak about disability. Let's start with the word disability. An individual with a disability is entitled to rights and protections under the law. The Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, and the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, IDEA, provide those rights and protections. You can find more information about both of those laws included in this module. Suffice it to say that the term disability or disabled is a word associated with rights, with a movement, and it is the preferred identity term of the adults fighting for equality for people with disabilities today. Disability is a neutral word. It's a descriptor. It is not insulting to refer to a person as having a disability or as being disabled. There's nothing tragic about disability, nor should we associate disability with inspiration. As such, it's an inappropriate to say to a disabled person, you are such a blessing, or you're such an inspiration simply because they have a disability. When speaking about disability, we encourage you to avoid euphemisms such as special needs or differently abled because it stigmatizes that which is different. If you do want to speak about a disabled individual's needs, you can refer to those as their functional needs or accessibility needs rather than special needs. Special needs fell out of fashion when advocates pointed out that there's nothing special about needing healthcare, education, safety, and access to public accommodations. We also encourage you to avoid terms that paint disability in a negative light. This includes terms that imply that disability renders a person helpless or sick, such as phrases like wheelchair bound or suffers from. While well-meaning, these turns of phrase can sound as though you wish a disabled person were someone they are not. It's inappropriate to apologize to someone when they say they have a disability or have a child with a disability or to express your disappointment. Disability is not a tragedy or an anomaly or a mistake. It's a fact of the human condition. Further, you should refrain from asking intrusive questions about a person's disability, health, or personal care routine. What happened to you? What's wrong with you? And how do you go to the bathroom? Are inappropriate questions to ask someone. If a person wants to share their personal medical information with you, they will do so voluntarily. If you want to know about a person's accessibility needs, you can do so by asking, is there anything I can do to make this activity or space more accessible for you? Or is there anything I should know to make sure that you can participate fully in this activity? These questions, just like asking someone if they have any allergies or dietary needs, allow the person to share their needs on their terms and extend the message that they are truly welcome in a space. A big topic when it comes to the language of disability is whether to use person-first language or identity-first language. This clip, created by the Iowa Coalition Against Domestic Violence, provides some guidance. You've probably been told that it's wrong to use someone's disability as a label. That because people are more than their disability, it's better to say person with epilepsy rather than an epileptic. Person-first language places the person ahead of their disability. A person with traumatic brain injury. A person with schizophrenia. And many individuals prefer to be referred to in this way. A survey of Facebook users with disability elicited the following responses. 
100% person first. We are not defined by what others suppose to be deficits. All are differently unique. All people should be known by who they are, not what they are. Person first. I may be bipolar, but I would rather people judge me for me, not my illness. I usually like people to say a person who is blind, not a blind person. I am a person first, blind second. But there are also individuals who prefer that the disability or disorder come first in the description. This is often called identity first language. I have cerebral palsy and I prefer identity first language. I consider my disability to be an inextricable part of my identity as a human being. It isn't negative to say I'm disabled. It's a statement of fact. My disability is a huge part of my identity and how I experience the world. To me, person-first language implies a degree of shame or negativity about disability. I embrace my disability because it influences so much of how I see and experience the world. In particular, there's a preference for identity-first language in the deaf community and the autism community. I am autistic. I cannot remove autism from my body. It is my neurotype. Just as I am tall, I am autistic. I do not have tallness. It makes being tall sound negative that way. Saying I have autism separates the autism from me. It makes autism sound negative. People can have cancer, but cancer is viewed as negative and separate from the person. I am autistic. I am tall too. Identity first. Disability is part of who I am. It's helped me grow as a person and brings me together with the community. Also, it's not my health that disables me. It's society's unwillingness to accommodate us. In respect of these two viewpoints, I often switch between person first and identity first language when I'm speaking in general. But the most important thing when advocating for someone is to find out how they like to be described and addressed. There is a lot of negative stigma in our society around disability. Disabled individuals have long been oppressed and portrayed as helpless or a burden on society. The symbol on the left is a product of that thinking. This traditional accessibility symbol paints disability as static, limiting, and requiring assistance. We hope to change the way that people think about disability so that it mirrors the message of the image on the right. This accessible icon portrays agency, activity, and empowerment. What we see informs what we think. This updated icon is available for free at accessibleicon.org, and we encourage you to use it. So while we're thinking about what we see and what we think, consider assistive technology, such as mobility aids or other equipment that allow individuals with disabilities to live full lives. People may incorrectly believe that this type of equipment is limiting or makes a person helpless. On the contrary, assistive technology, or AT, is empowering and allows individuals to complete the daily tasks of life, often with more independence. Adaptive equipment doesn't hold people back. It allows them to access a world not otherwise built for them. Models of disability are tools for defining disability and ultimately for providing a base upon which government and society can devise strategies for meeting the needs of disabled people. There are several models of disability, but three in particular to which we want to draw attention. The first is the medical model, which paints disability as something that is purely biological and something that should be treated, healed, or fixed. The medical model generally subscribes to the idea that a disability strays from the norm and needs to be addressed by the person with the disability through therapies and other treatments so that they can participate in normal society. The next is the social model, which takes the viewpoint that disability is not a biological affliction, but rather something that society inflicts upon a person. A person is not disabled by a difference in their biology. Instead, they are disabled by society's lack of accessibility and acceptance. From this perspective, it's society that should change to accommodate a diverse range of needs, rather than the responsibility falling to the individual with a disability. The final model we'd like to share is the biopsychosocial model. This takes a more holistic view of disability, where an individual can identify strongly with their disability as an aspect of their biology, while also acknowledging that social and environmental factors can be disabling as well. 
Take a moment to consider your personal understanding of disability up to this point. Most people are brought up with a viewpoint that is much like the medical model. With a greater knowledge and understanding of disability as a part of human diversity, we hope that people shift to a perspective that aligns more with that of the social or biopsychosocial models of disability. We'd be remiss if we didn't address the concept of ableism in this training. Ableism is a set of beliefs or practices that devalue and discriminate against people with disabilities. In short, ableism is the belief that a disabled life is less valuable or worthy than a non-disabled life. It is the last socially acceptable form of discrimination. Ableism is something most people haven't heard of before. Like racism and sexism, there are some very obvious examples of ableism, but also many examples that are less obvious forms of ableism. Obvious examples include using the R word, treating disabled people in a cruel manner, or believing that disabled people are less deserving of the same rights and privileges that non-disabled people are afforded. But many people regularly and unknowingly carry out less obvious examples of ableism every day. These include microaggressions, such as making judgments about people because they do or do not, quote, look disabled. Ableism is present in spaces that are blatantly inaccessible, making them impossible for a disabled individual to enter. Additionally, the belief that students with disabilities who are included in the general education classroom necessarily detract from non-disabled students' learning experiences is inherently ableist. In fact, the inclusion of individuals with disabilities benefits all people, those with and without disabilities. Consider these three beliefs. Accessible spaces are better spaces. Think about modifications and accommodations that were originally designed for people with disabilities that benefit all people, such as curb cuts from the sidewalk to the street. These are beneficial to wheelchair users, yes, but also to people pushing strollers or toting luggage. When a space is accessible, it communicates that all are welcome and makes the space better for all who use it. Taking a universal design approach ensures that spaces and activities are accessible to all people. Inclusive activities are richer activities. While inclusive activities aren't always easier, they do ensure that participants will have access to diverse perspectives and therefore more opportunities for learning and growth. All human lives have equal value. When we encounter someone who appears or seems different, our interactions may present challenges. The belief that everyone has something meaningful to contribute allows us to persevere through challenging or uncomfortable interactions and give people the benefit of the doubt. This belief also requires us to choose a kind response and to honor the dignity of others. Now you're thinking like an includer, valuing diversity and considering others' needs and what they can contribute. Now, what behaviors might be necessary to act like an includer? There are three main behaviors to consider. First, creativity. In order to be inclusive and design inclusive spaces and activities, we need to plan ahead and be intentional about the design of those spaces and activities. Ask about people's accessibility needs and look for ways to accommodate them using tools or adapting activities when needed. If you're not sure how to make something inclusive, ask for advice. Risk-taking is a critical skill for includers. It's a natural human impulse to surround yourself with people with whom you feel you have a lot in common. In order to welcome diverse experiences and perspectives, we have to be willing to step outside of our comfort zones, meet new people, try new things, and get to know other people's stories. Above all, we need empathy to be inclusive. This means taking time to get to know and understand people, to tune into their feelings, and look for ways to support them when they are in need. This collection of beliefs and behaviors makes up what we call an ability-inclusive mindset. This is what we cultivate in our students over the course of a full school year in each of our programs. It's something that is built steadily over time as students engage with one another, learn about disability and difference, and practice empathy. Armed with this ability-inclusive mindset, you have everything you need to be a change maker in your school and community. Thank you for your commitment to inclusion.